salutations. In this edition for the Guantanamo Grammar Shoot podcast, I'm going to be talking about flag mechanics and I'm going to be talking about the history of the 1 by 1.9 uh, Title IV flag as in the context of correct site and structure communication, parsing syntax grammar, the wonderful technology brought to the public in 1988 by the late Colin David Eiffelwin Colin Miller. The reason I'm going to be talking about this is because I've gotten a lot of questions about it of late. A lot of folks, even folks who have a, a very high level of, of correct site and structure knowledge, still don't seem to be clear on the flag, how it's used, and its history. And uh, quite frankly, there's a lot of fear involved in these questions. And so I just thought I would uh, talk about it here in a very informal format and help to perhaps ease some of these fears and give you folks out there closure. Because this is the Quantum Grammar Shoot Podcast for the Quantum Grammar Shoot Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Jason Knife and Matthew Colin Glass. You may call me Jason. And let's get right into it. Ah, but I would be remiss if I didn't say this is the only podcast of its kind that I know of on the interwebs. So the 1 by 1.9 flag. A lot's been said about it. If, like me, um, you were studying quantum grammar while Colin, Colin David Eiffel and Colin Miller was still living in 2017, um, you knew, what you knew about the flag came from him and also Colin Russell hyphen J. Colin Gould. They would tell the story of the 1 by 1.9 flag, their story of the flag in all of their director's parties and seminars and things like that, talking about how they captured it, how the copyrights to the particular uh, ratio of flag ran out and they jumped on the opportunity to file copyrights for it using their version of the grammar technology of quantum grammar. I'm guessing that's what they did. They didn't really ever specifically say how they did it. Now, if one were to take on face value what they said, that the copyrights to the Title IV flag ran out, expired, and so they jumped in and basically uh, gained their own copyright to the flag using their own methods. That could mean a couple things. The first thing it brings to mind that I was getting to is that they actually applied for a copyright through the normal channels in the fiction of how one pays for a copyright or a patent or you know, whatever else it is. Not a patent, but what I'm saying is you apply through the fiction to copyright something, and you have to pay a fee to do that. They either did that, or they did it through the postal mechanics where they created a document contract postal vessel core venue, mailed it to themselves, got that quote-unquote registered number, and now they claim that flag and then they publish it, and if no one challenges them over a certain timeline, a drogue, then their copyright stands because no one challenged them on it. Now, it could be any of those things there. I don't know. They never, ever really gave closure to that as to how it happened. And for me, it doesn't really matter to me how it happened. It doesn't matter to me, and you will find out why in a short while here, I will give you closure as to why that doesn't bother me. It doesn't really matter to me what the specifics are. Okay. Here are what Jim Lampley from HBO Boxing would call the official particulars. 
They use the terminology captured the flag. They captured the flag. I'll say it a third time. They captured the flag. Both Russell and David have made that claim. Together. A joint effort. Back when they were friends and used to work together, David was the master, Russell was the student. Quite obviously. There is no denying that was the scenario. So, using the word capture, if you look it up, just in in any dictionary, what capture means, to capture something. Of course, it's going to give you multiple meanings. But if you really start looking into it, you'll be amazed at what you find. Because when you listen to Colin David Eiffel and Colin Miller and Colin Russell Eiffel and J. Colin Gould speak in their directors' parties and their seminars, they talk about war negating contract. War negates contract because contract is by consent. Period. End of story. Do no harm. Rule one, rule equal. Contract is by consent. War negates contract. I can't stress that enough because they use the word capture. Capture implies that there's coercion happening, that there was no choice involved. When you capture a criminal, what are you doing? You're taking a criminal against their will. Okay? When you capture, uh, say there's a rabid uh, raccoon running around outside your house, or a rabid skunk, or a rabid possum, or whatever it is, and you capture it, you are taking it against its will. And they specifically use the word capture as it relates to the flag. I know the flag's an inanimate object, but language is everything. Grammar is everything. How you word it is how it's meant to be taken. (laughs) And that is the beautiful thing about correct sentence structure is it takes that guesswork out of it. It is what it is. Words mean what they mean. One word, one meaning, one and one is one. Anyways, capture has a negative connotation, meaning something was taken against its will. If something is captured, taken against its will, that is an act of war. Coercion is construed as an act of war. Basically, if you're out there trapping a a rabid skunk, you are taking it against its will. You're capturing it. That's in that raccoon or that skunk or that possum is going to construe that as an act of war. If you come at me and try and trap me and put me in a cage or something, I'm going to fight back that you are committing war on me, an act of war. You are making me trying to make me do something against my will. Capture me. There you go act of war. And they use this word capture. So in my mind, by their own teaching, David and Russell's own teaching, they committed an act of war while capturing a flag. Therefore, their, any contract or claim they have to that flag is null and void based upon that very piece of data. That single solitary piece of data that they admit confess that they captured the flag is an act of war. And so it negates any claim that they have, any copyright they have on on the flag, because it was gained through an act of war, and war negates contract by their own words. I keep saying this over and over in different ways, because I'm trying to get this to sink in to those folks out there who aren't quite getting it. That's the first thing. Now, the second thing is the grammar. Now, this is known as a grammar flag. The 1 by 1.9 Title IV flag is known as a grammar flag, the flag of correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, which is a contract grammar. Everything is contract, and that's why David calls it the flag of the land during the time of the contract. So it is a correct grammar flag, meaning... If you put that 1 by 1.9 flag on your contract and you use the correct postal mechanics, the fee for freight, 
and you know all the autographing and everything else that goes along with it, the banking mechanics, then that means that you are supposed to know what you're doing. You're supposed to know correct sentence structure. What you have on that paper is correct grammar. That is what you are saying when you put the flag on there. So and wouldn't you think, logically, wouldn't you think that if someone is claiming the copyright to a correct sentence structure communication parse syntax grammar flag, a flag of quantum grammar, a flag of correct grammar, if someone is claiming a copyright on that, wouldn't the copyright have to be incorrect grammar with no mistakes? Wouldn't it, the grammar have to follow those rules? Rule one, rule equal. Wouldn't the copyright holder of the grammar and the flag have to know correct grammar and be able to perform on that and be able to write out a document contract postal vessel court venue with no mistakes on it, claiming said copyrights? Because folks, in my six plus years of doing this, and I've looked at thousands and thousands of pages of correct sentence structure, nowhere on planet Earth that I've ever seen is there a correct sentence structure communication parsley syntax grammar copyright copy claim for the Title IV flag. There are folks out there who have published things claiming to be a copyright copy claim for that flag. But when you look at the grammar, it is not correct. The grammar is not correct. So therefore, that negates the contract by the very rules of correct sentence structure. If you are not using the mathematical interface on grammar, if your sentences are not mathematically certified forwards and backwards with correct positionals, lodials, facts, punctuation, all that stuff, concatenation, if it's not correct, then how can you logically think that you have any type of claim on any correct grammar flag? So that's the second thing. There is no correct grammar contract written by either Russell or David that exists that I've seen that lays claim to that flag. There's quantum gobbledygook. There's adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, uh, mishmash of grammar that sort of looks like quantum grammar, but it's not when you really look at it because the positional concatenation is wrong. There are incorrect positionals in there. Folks, there are four positionals. Just, just as a quick example. Four positionals, four of, with, and by. Four is congruent with, by of is congruent with, with. One and one is one. One congruency, one meaning, one function. Four is cause, of is concern, with is possessive, by is authority. But these folks, both David and Russell, are putting in other positionals like in, on, um, out, through. I mean, if it's one word, one meaning, one function, one and one is one, then when you read a sentence with the positional in, then when you read it backwards, it's going to have to be out, isn't it? And that means a completely different thing than in. You're either in the house or you're out of the house. So how can you have two meanings for one positional? You don't. You can't. I mean, if, how, how can you have two meanings, one meaning going forward, one meaning going backwards? You can't do that with correct sentence structure. So again... By virtue of the rules that David created, he violated his own rules in those contracts. I'm not going to get into why he did that, because it's all speculation. I know the, the, the folks who have a real soft spot for David and they put him on a pedestal. I know that they try and make all kinds of excuses for the man, saying that, oh, well, he made all these mistakes on purpose because he wanted to keep the grammar safe. Really? See, on the surface, if you're just sort of like, you don't want to poke in too far, that might be enough for some folks, all right? But what honorable and uh, virtuous and honest individual would purposely teach something wrong to somebody else, knowing that purposely putting out misinformation would get other people in trouble, knowing 
that it would get them into trouble or could possibly get them into trouble. What type of man does that? So if you're saying that David purposely made mistakes, he did it on purpose, then you're also saying that he had malicious intent, knowing that people were going to get into trouble. Okay? So let's stop that BS right there. I'm not here to badmouth anybody. From what I knew of Colin David Eiffel and Colin Miller as a person, as a human, as a man, he was nothing but kind to me. He was very patient. I had conversations with him while he was in the last year of his life, and he was always very accommodating. He always answered his phone for me and answered my questions and emails and Skypes and whatever else, text messages. I personally uh, got my textbook, David Wood Miller textbook from him. I sent him 200 bucks and he mailed it to me and paid the postage. Um, I'm very grateful all of those things. I am not saying anything about his character. If you're saying that he purposely put mistakes in his grammar, then you're slandering his character because now you're saying that he was malicious knowing that people could possibly be harmed by his actions. I personally, knowing what I know of the guy, I'm not saying that about him. I'm looking at the evidence that's in front of me because I do have closure on the grammar. And the evidence points to his grammar performances that maybe he didn't have closure on the grammar. He, maybe he didn't have the closure that he said he did. Now, there's a difference because you don't know what you don't know. He always says that, right? You don't know what you don't know. So maybe he didn't know what he didn't know. Maybe he thought that he knew. Maybe what he put out there he thought was correct to the best of his knowledge because that's the best any of us can do is to do something to the best of our ability and knowledge. That's all we can do. That's all anyone can ever ask of us. We can't do any more than that because we don't know. So it's the same thing with him. He's no different than you and I. He was a man, okay? He was a human. To err is human. Everybody makes mistakes. And as evidence, more evidence to back up what I'm postulating here, that he didn't have closure on the grammar or he didn't have full closure on the grammar, His student, Russell J. Gould, his apprentice, makes the same exact mistakes that David made. Same ones. In his paperwork, teacher makes these specific mistakes. Student also makes these specific mistakes. Is that a coincidence? Folks, I don't participate with the... uh, concept of coincidence all right so we can get that out of the way either colin david i from Winkola miller number one purposely put out misleading knowledge in his book and paperwork and seminars or two david did not actually have the closure on the grammar he didn't actually have full closure on it. And so, um, through nascience, he put out mistakes in his book and in paperwork and in seminars through nascience, meaning he didn't know what he didn't know. And of course, there are other options. Uh, the third option could be possibly that he was somehow threatened into doing that, to putting something out with mistakes and then acting like it was correct or making excuses for it. But, you know, it's, it's also a possibility. You can't really discount that. And those folks out there that put him on a pedestal and look up to him, that might comfort them a little bit. But on the other hand, um, it actually leads to some other issues if you're going to think that way that David was coerced into doing 
putting mistakes into his work, then what type of an individual is that that would do that, that would cave to pressure and willfully hurt other people to protect other people? You know, there are other ways to go about things. But here is the kicker. We must also remember that David always claimed to be a 92nd degree Freemason. Let that sink in. Take all of this into the context of Freemasonry and what it means to be a Freemason and the oaths and vows that they take to their brotherhood and to their craft. So I think I've given you enough data to come to your own conclusions. Now the end question is this, which has been asked. Well, if all of that's true about the flag, if there is no correct contract for the flag, if the war negates contract, the flag was captured, negates the contract of the flag to be used as correct sentence structure, well then how can you use it as a correct sentence structure flag? So my answer to that is a question. Where does authority come from? Yes, you regular viewers out there, you will know the answer to this because I've made countless videos about authority. Coming at it from all different angles. Authority in one sense, comes from knowledge. If you know what you're doing, then you have the authority to do it. Okay? You can back up your claims. If I claim to be able to fix cars, if someone has a problem with a car, I can get in there and fix it. I can look at the engine, diagnose it, and fix it. I can make that claim. I'm a mechanic. Well, then someone pulls up with a car and says, prove it. This car is something wrong with it. You figure out what's wrong with it. Okay, boom, boom, boom. I fix it within 30 minutes. Oh, he knows what he's doing. He just showed me he knows what he's doing. <clears throat> the proof is in the performance. I have the knowledge of engine mechanics. I can fix them. I'm mechanically inclined. Therefore, I have the knowledge, I have the authority to do that. It, and now, it appears as though <laughs> there is uh, some sort of siren going off in the background. Great timing. Anyways, so that's where authority comes from, if you know what you're doing. So that's the stance I take with the flag. If you have closure on correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar then you have the authority to use that flag because that flag is the correct sentence structure flag. Now that may seem kind of tenuous to you, but if you are afraid that you're going to get into trouble, quote unquote trouble, ooh, using that one by 1.9 flag, then that means a couple things about you that you might need to think about. Number one, it means you don't have closure on the grammar. You don't have full closure on the grammar. Number two, you're giving jurisdiction to the fiction. In your mind, mentally, psychologically, the fiction still has power over you. It's like these people that are afraid that if they get a live life claim, that they're going to somehow get into trouble with the fiction. says, well, am I going to get in trouble if I ever get a live life claim? You know, if you're thinking like that, then... That's fiction mentality and the fiction that authoritarian construct still holds power over you. And that's something you definitely probably have to work on if you want to use this and be, have any type of success with it. All right. So here's my other piece of evidence to back up why it doesn't matter to me whether there's a correct contract or not for the flag. Because I have had success with it personally for the last six plus years. I have made dozens and dozens and dozens of correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, document, contract, postal vessel court venues. And I have never once failed. I have a 100% success rate. 
I've been successful in every single case to stop bureaucratic trespass using that flag. And so as I was saying about performance, performance is proof. I myself had my doubts in 2017 about the flag and about getting into trouble using it. Well, what's going to happen? Well, I didn't know what was going to happen, so I started using it. Even before I had full closure under grammar, I started using it and mailing out documents. And I was successful. And the more success I had, the more confidence built. And then I started teaching. And so I personally, I wouldn't be teaching this if I didn't know that it worked. And that the flag works. And all these things work together that I teach. All right? I wouldn't be teaching it if that were the case. If I was just out here to make a fast buck, I'd be doing what other folks were doing. Or are doing. You know, I'd be selling courses and having a Patreon and putting it behind a paywall and starting up a learning center and charging hundreds and thousands of dollars for live life claims and other documents and getting people to believe that they had to go through me in order to do anything with this stuff. And uh, that would be pretty easy to do. But I've never once done that, folks. Never, never, never. I've always done the same thing. If you want to apply for a workshop with me, I have to meet you face to face during a video chat. You have to email me and then we talk and then I vet you and you vet me, vice versa. And we go from there. It's always been that way. There is no, there is no paywall with me. Because everything I know about correct sentence structure is available for free on this YouTube channel. 900 or so videos. And so I think that's what keeps me safe. It's definitely not the most lucrative thing to navigate on a donation gift basis. I can tell you that. Because so many folks out there just want free stuff. They feel everything should be free. The most that I have are, are places where you can donate to support me if you want to. If you appreciate the knowledge I'm sharing with you, you can go to the Buy Me a Coffee website. You can go to, you know, you could actually email me and I will give you a venue where you can send a donation if you want to. Or you can donate via YouTube through Super Chats, Super Stickers and memberships and things like that. But that's up to you. I'm not telling you you have to do that to get this knowledge. This knowledge is free right now, right here to you. So to circle back to the flag, that is why it doesn't matter to me whether there's a contract or not for the flag, because I know through personal experience, firsthand knowledge, that knowledge is authority. And if you know how to do it, if you know how to use the grammar, then you'll be perfectly safe using that flag and navigating safely in and out of different venues with the position of peace and neutrality, the balance of honor and grace. And the maintenance of rule one, rule equal. If you have closure on the grammar and the skill to convey that closure to another contract party under duress. Perfectly safe. The flag is, uh, as you could say in the fiction, the flag is a real thing. It really, really works. When you walk into foreign vessels in dry dock and you claim the wall of the court, it works. The flag works. Flag protocols. Army Regs 840-10. That's the place you start if you want to start learning about the flag. If you're going to use the flag, if you're going to use the 1 by 1.9 flag, I do caution you. You probably should have the constitution on you, the flag constitution for the 1, point, 1 by 1.9 flag. And you may ask, where do I find that? Well, you have to write it yourself. There are no gimmies here. But a good place to start would be to take the flag constitution that Cola David Eiffelman Cola Miller had publicly available on his website. And I think a copy of it is in his book. I'm not quite sure. Don't quote me on that. But it for sure is on his website. Copy and paste that into a Word document and then go through and correct it. Because there are a ton of mistakes in that Constitution. 
You correct the mistakes to the best of your knowledge, and then it becomes a peaceful and neutral constitution. You are not claiming that flag. You're not owning it. You're not claiming copyright of the flag. You are using the flag. There is a difference. And who would want to own something like that anyways? I have to question the integrity or volition of someone whose intent is to own something like that. I can only imagine that they just want to own it to make money or something like that. That's why they would want to own it. That's a guess on my part. I know some people will say, oh, well, somebody has to do it to safeguard it. Biggest pile of bullshit. When someone starts saying that, oh, he's going to safeguard the grammar. Oh, they're going to safeguard the flag. It's bullshit. Complete and utter bullshit. And that's all I'll say about that. Oh, I hope YouTube doesn't strike this because I just cussed and like said like three or four cuss words in like 15 seconds. <laughs> All right, I don't know. I, th- I hope I covered everything. If I didn't, I'll, I'll make another podcast and cover what I didn't cover. But uh, thanks for listening. Hope this helps everybody out there. Peace. Peace.